right? Are we uh, ready for the word? Yep. yep, okay. So lots of people out of town right now, but thank you all for being here. We're going to have fun. I know. So uh, what I want to call this, I guess, is uh, how to get unstuck <laughs> with God and people. And uh, I've you know, been doing kind of a sort of a series loosely on relationship. I'm, I'm kind of intending to just once a year at least spend three or four weeks on relationship stuff, you know, skills and things. And uh, hopefully I learn more as we go and I can give you more. But uh, every year we want to spend some time on it and just go over principles that we know work and also go a little bit deeper with things we know. Uh, but uh, this, this one is really, it's kind of in the same vein. I'm still talking about relationships, so how to get unstuck with both God and people. And the, uh, the actual, uh, the title I could have call, called it was Repentance. <laughs> but uh, I called it Getting Unstuck instead. <laughs> but it's actually the same, same kind of thing. So let's, uh, let's explore. Uh, I, I was actually going to look for one of those pictures. I didn't, I didn't have time to do it. But you ever see the, those pictures with you know, the, the crazy looking guy that has the sign, repent, the end is near? Right? I wanted to put a picture like that up on the screen. I just didn't, didn't quite get the time to do it. But uh, you, you, you know, you kinda, a lot of people got that association in their mind with the word repent, that it's you know, kind of you know, God's angry and you know, some wild-haired John the Baptist wannabe you know, pounding on you to repent. You know? And uh, that's kind of the idea I had of that word too, really. Uh, but it's actually a beautiful, beautiful tool. It's a beautiful way to get free. Um, it's a way to get unstuck when you're stuck. Plain and simple. Look at uh, Matthew 4.17. Uh, so this is uh, right, right after Jesus. He's beginning his ministry. He's just been baptized in the river, filled with the Holy Spirit, went into the temptation in the wilderness, and uh, uh, comes out of that victoriously. And then he begins his ministry and says, from that time... Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And again, you know, there's several, several misconceptions that people have about the word repent, the concept of repent, that I want to address because I had them and probably some of you have them, uh, which is, you know, again, the John the Baptist wannabe, you know, pounding on you to repent. Uh, the implication being you're a bad person, but you need to try to get good. You know, stop doing this and start doing this. Don't do any more of that and always do this. You know, so that's kind of the idea with that. And... Uh, I think I shared with you before when I was my, my first Bible school, I went to two. Uh, first one was a bad experience, the second one was a good experience. And the first one I went to, there was a woman there who, she was one of the teachers there, and uh, she, she said the Christian life is a life of continual repentance. And I thought that sounded absolutely horrible. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I think I'm out. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I want to sign up for this. And uh, it was because my idea of repentance wasn't exactly right. Uh, the idea that I had of it was, again, it's this thing of you're bad trying to get good, but you're so bad you can never really get good, you know, <laughs> and just keep trying and keep trying, you know, because you're a miserable sinner and, you know, just keep trying. And so that's kind of the idea I had. I'm like, well, that sounds like a whole lot of fun. Thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, until actually uh, uh, I heard somebody with a little bit, little bit more awareness uh, share the definition of the word repent. All you have to do is open a concordance, right, and look it up, in the, in the, especially in the New Testament in Greek. And uh, how many know, right, it is the word metanoia in Greek, which means to change your mind, change your attitude, change your way of thinking. That's all it means. Right? It actually is kind of a transformation of thinking. And so... Now, you know, because it's interesting here, Jesus, who's he addressing? Uh, he's in Israel for the most part here, right? He's in Israel territory, most of his ministry, and he's addressing Jews who are living under the law of Moses for the most part. And there's also people in that society who were really kind of out, you know, they were the, uh, the sinners are called and the, you know, the, the people of ill repute, and they were in that community, clearly, but... Um, but really, Jesus seems, for the most part, to be addressing kind of the, the most religious, religiously observant people in the world, <laughs> right? I mean, these, these are the people that are following God's laws as best they can, you know? Um, if he really wanted to look for the, the sinners, I remember like Jonah and Nineveh, that would have been, you know, a better place. But this is Jesus in Israel, in the most, you know, religiously observant place on earth at that point. And so he's saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, so if you understand that he means... Open your mind, be willing to change, be teachable, be willing to reject something and, and embrace something new, 
right? Be willing to look at what you believe. And if it's wrong, get rid of it and, and embrace what, what Jesus is bringing. Because look, why did he say repent? The, the reason is immediately following. Repent for or because, why? The kingdom of heaven's here. The kingdom's here. The kingdom's here. You're about to, Jesus is going to present the kingdom of God. He's going to demonstrate the kingdom of God. He's going to put the kingdom of God right in, right in people's faces with power right, and with truth and love and revelation and all kinds of demonstration of the Holy Spirit. And, and it's going to be right there. And he says, and basically, he's offering it to us. Isn't that true? Jesus literally came to offer us the kingdom. Remember when he said, don't be afraid, little flock. It's my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So he's literally here first saying presenting the kingdom, demonstrating the kingdom, and then offering the kingdom. Come enter into it, be part of it, and receive it, okay? And possess it, literally. And so in order for us to do that, in the, in the, in the people of that day, both the, the sinners of ill repute and the people, the religious people who were, you know, but more law-oriented, uh, they both had to change their thinking, didn't they? They both had to change their thinking. And in the case of the law keeper, the, the law oriented people, it was more about abandoning their own self reliance, right? And their own ability to please God through, through uh, religion. And it was abandoning that and changing some attitudes. And then for other, other people, it would be, it would be uh, changing some of the things they, they believed and lived. But he said, really, the reason I'm asking you to repent and telling you to repent. Uh, metanoia, change your mind, change your attitude, open your thinking to something new, is because I'm presenting you the kingdom of God. And there's certain common human attitudes that will defeat you and hinder you if you try to, you know, if you're presented with the kingdom of God, but you hold on to these attitudes. There's some attitudes that need to be changed. And if they are, if you do that preparation, you will enter into the kingdom of God and begin to take possession of the kingdom of God. Right? begin to walk effectively in the kingdom of God. But if you don't change some of those attitudes, they, you simply are hindering yourself. You're, you're not, it's not going to work very well. Uh, in, the, in the Hebrew, repent was also used throughout the Old Testament, and it does more imply kind of change your mind and then change your direction. It's kind of one continuous thing. But especially in the, in the New Testament, the Greek, it really is about primarily changing the mind. And one of the reasons that's important is because, again, a, a common misconception we have of the word repent is that it's just about changing behavior. Okay? You're doing this, stop doing this, start doing that. Just about changing behavior. And that's actually a very, very shallow, impoverished definition of repent because what it, what it really means here is to internalize something, right? Something on the inside of you Break agreement with something that's not true. Break agreement with something that's inferior or something that's of darkness. And then embrace and receive something that's true and superior. Right? And this is very empowering. It's a very, very empowering thing. But it's not just changing outward behavior to make somebody happy. It's, change, right? it's receiving a change, a transformation on the inside. And uh, it's, a, it's a tool for getting unstuck. It's a tool for breakthrough. It's a tool for all kinds of um, spiritual growth and progress. Uh, so, let's see. There's several several uh, benefits of of, or let's see. Several things he wants us to repent of. Let's put it this way: recognizing attitudes and mindsets that hinder you from entering the kingdom, um, and and living in the kingdom successfully, or rec recognizing attitudes and mindsets that are grievous to the heart of God, and being willing to recognize when we are out of agreement with God and come into agreement. So let's give examples. Uh, they're all in Matthew, which I didn't realize until after I'd prepare my notes. Uh, <laughs> look at Matthew 13, uh, verse 44. So, uh, Jesus, uh, not only did he in the beginning say, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, but he made it more specific as he went along. Okay? So he began to say specific, address specific things that would give people breakthrough and improve their relationship with God through what we call repentance, right? Again, keep in mind, it means transformation of thinking, attitude, and understanding, not just a change of behavior. So Jesus is applying that principle in his teachings to different audiences and different groups. And here, speaking to, uh, basically just speaking to the common people, he said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. 
Okay. And per the parables always have many layers that you can get into. Right now, I just want to stay on the surface layer of this, which is legitimate. And the surface layer is, he's saying the kingdom of, kingdom of God is like treasure. Okay? And it's in a field, and he says, this man sold everything he had to get it. Okay? What's, what's he simply trying to say? The kingdom of God has great value. It's a treasure, right? When it's offered to you, you're being offered something that is so valuable, so amazing, so precious, so powerful, so transformational, so just absolutely highly valuable. And what does this have to do with repentance? Repentance is, again, when we, when we recognize in ourselves that we believe a lie or embrace a lie or there's an attitude that hinders us, right? Repentance, is, repentance breaks us free. It gets us unstuck. So what would, be the, what would this be talking about? If we have an attitude that the things of God are just not really that valuable and not really worth pursuing at any cost, then we're wrong. <laughs> we're, we're just wrong. We're out of agreement with God. God. Jesus is saying right here, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that is so precious, so amazing. If you have any idea what's being offered to you, you would do anything to pursue it and keep pursuing it and embrace all of it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And if you, if you don't understand that, you're believing a lie. Plain and simple. And that lie is going to hurt you. It's going to keep you from getting this amazing, amazing thing or from really walking in the fullness of it. So uh, is this repentance? Yeah. The moment you recognize that you believed a lie, what do you do? <laughs> Say, wow, I was wrong. I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to change my attitude, change my thinking. I'm going to recognize the value of the kingdom of God and the things of God and the relationship with God. I'm going to recognize the value of this and pursue it. Right? And, and, and so when the moment you do that, you just repented. And the moment you did that, you got a breakthrough. You just came into agreement with God and God said, thank you. <laughs> right? Thank you for understanding what's being offered to you and coming into agreement with that. Now we're going to go somewhere. Right? But, until you, but as long as you believe that it didn't have great value, you're stuck. Eh? You're kind of stuck. So this actually, what does this have to do with people, too? Um, actually, it's kind of a similar thing. Um, how many of you under, undervalue some of the people in your life until God opens your eyes and makes you understand how precious those people are and those relationships are? Maybe they're like a treasure in the field, too, that we sometimes we undervalue the relationships we have and the people we have. And when we repent, again, change our attitude, change our thinking, and recognize the value of the people we have, we get unstuck. We get breakthrough. We begin to treat people differently because we have a new understanding and relationships go whew, prosper that before were withering and starving. Amen. Yeah. Uh, how about, uh, look at this one, Matthew 9. Verse uh, 9 to 13. Here's another time. I'm jumping around uh, chronologically, uh, but uh, it's all in Matthew. And this is, a, this is when Jesus is calling disciples, right? initially inviting people to follow him. So Jesus passed on from there, and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And this is written by Matthew. Matthew is also called Levi right? at that point. And uh, Jesus said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. And again, you know, you know about the tax collectors, right? They were hated, despised, yeah, scum of the earth in the eyes of most of the people there. Uh, but Jesus saw value in this guy. Isn't that nice when Jesus sees value in somebody that everybody else rejects? <laughs> yeah. Amazing, yeah. And uh, so the, the short lesson on that, again, is if, if, if Jesus has chosen you, um, even if nobody under, else understands why, <laughs> Jesus said, I made the right choice. You're, you're, I want you, right? I want you. There's a reason. Uh, now, as it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard that, he said to them, you know this one, right? Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And, I think 13 also, yes. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So, all right, oh, so we are talking about repentance again here too, right? So everywhere, when Jesus was interacting with different groups of people, 
and how they responded to him and how they responded to situations, how their hearts were exposed, their motives, their thoughts were exposed. Jesus is calling them to repentance. Why? Because they're bad and he wants to condemn them? Or because he wants them to get unstuck? He wants them to get unstuck. They're embracing a lie. They're believing something that's hindering them. They have a wrong attitude, and it's going to cause them complete defeat, even loss of eternal life. But if they will be willing to examine their beliefs, their attitudes, and make a correction, which is a humbling thing to do, isn't it? If they'll be willing to make a correction in their attitude, they can get unstuck and begin walking and begin receiving that kingdom and walking in victory, right? So repentance is about getting unstuck. It really is about getting out of defeat and into victory. Uh, change of mind. So what's happening here? This story again, Jesus calls a guy named Matthew, Levi, to follow him. Levi was rejected by society, and, uh, but Jesus wants him. And then all of Levi's friends are coming, the prostitutes and the sinners and the, probably the, who knows what all <laughs> was going on. It's, it just said, what did it say? Tax collectors and sinners, right? Okay. So tax collectors and sinners are coming, and they're eating with Jesus. And then the Pharisees get upset. So um, what's really cool here uh, is who did G between the two groups, the Pharisees and the broken people, who did Jesus actually want to be with? <laughs> Apparently the broken people, right? Yeah. Um, this is like, you know, you know, if Jesus was the new guy at the high school, you know, and he goes to the cafeteria at lunch, he's the new kid. And he sees the Pharisees at one table and he sees all the broken, messed up kids at the other table. Where does Jesus go? He goes right to the broken people. Boom. And the Pharisees are going, what? <laughs> and essentially Jesus says to them, I don't know what you're getting all upset about. You should have been here with the broken people before I got here. If you had any idea about God's heart, if you had any real understanding of God's heart, when I got here, you should have already been sitting with the broken people trying to restore them. <laughs> but they weren't, were they? <laughs> no, they weren't. So he's confronting basically their law orientation and their hardness of heart and their lack of compassion. Right? He's confronting that and saying, this attitude is going to defeat you and destroy you. You're completely out of agreement with God's heart, and it makes you yucky, <laughs> right? It says, if you, and so he says to them, go and learn what this means. Now, he's quoting the scriptures, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. That's in, the, that's in the scriptures, and Jesus says, go find out what it means. Go ask the Holy Spirit what it means. Be willing to examine your attitudes. Be willing to examine your heart, and if you come to a new conclusion, that you, th that you thought you knew it all, but you find out maybe you didn't know it all, be willing to change. Be willing to okay, open your heart to something new. That's a, essentially, Jesus is doing the same thing. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? Examine what's holding you back, what's defeating you, what's trapping you, what's putting you in bondage, what's, putting you, what's grieving God's heart and putting you out of fellowship with God, and be, and be willing to get free. Right? Examine it. So he calls... He says, find out what this means. Now, what's interesting too, look at verse 12 again, 12 and 13. I'm going to compare it. When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are, what's the word there again? Sick, okay. He says sick, and then, verse 13, and then he says, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners, to repentance. And so, uh, are they sick or are they sinners? Or are they both? Both, yeah, apparently. So, you know, I've, I've uh, had that discussion with people before, you know, and I've used that term that people are sick and broken, and I've, and I've had religious people respond to me. They're not sick or broken, they're sinners. They, need just, they just need to repent. I'm like, okay. But I think Jesus called them sick also. He did call them sinners, but he also called them sick. And what that apparently means is that a lot of people, when they're broken and empty and desperate and messed up, they're not real concerned with following the rules. It's not like they're high priority to follow the rules. What their priority is, is to find what's going to fill their empty, broken heart. But that search leads them in all the wrong directions usually. <laughs> it just leads them in all the wrong directions. And Jesus knows that. And instead of going to the, you know, in the cafeteria, instead of going to the Pharisee table, right, he goes over to the messed up people's table 
And he's there because it's basically, I know you guys are just breaking all the rules here, but I also recognize that you're sick and you're broken and you're hurting and you're empty. And so did he say he wanted to bring sinners to repentance? Yes, he did. But did he also acknowledge they're sick? I'm a doctor also. They need healing. Is it both? Yeah, it's both. It's both. But what the, what the Pharisees were wrong about is they had no compassion. They should have been there first. Okay. Uh, so when, uh, when we find out in our relationships too, when we find out that we have wrong attitudes towards the people in our lives, spouse, <laughs> blood, children, grandchildren, friends, whoever, when we find out that we just have wrong attitudes, the way to, usually the way to begin to fix those things is, again, how do you get unstuck? Repentance, right? It's repentance. Find out where our attitude is wrong and fix it. I was in, uh, y'all know, right? I started off in Alcoholics Anonymous before I got saved and because uh, I, I drank a lot <laughs> from the age of 15 to 21. <laughs> I drank a lot. And, uh, and so I was in AA with all my new friends when I was 21, and they were all 50s and 60s. And uh, I remember one guy told me, he said, the, the key to, uh, the key to uh, really making progress here is be very, very quick and willing to admit that you might be wrong about anything. I remember him saying that. It always stuck with me. Be willing to admit you're wrong about anything. And do it quickly. Okay? So whenever you're presented with something that might be true, honestly look at it. Honestly look at yourself. Okay? And if you find out in something, don't fight it. Don't make a big fuss over it. Don't justify it and make a hundred excuses. And I have to and I can't change and I'm like this because and, you know. Just admit it. Just admit it. <laughs> Once you admit it, you're halfway there. <laughs> now God can work with you. Now it can change, right? You can get your breakthrough. You can get unstuck. You can move forward. But uh, I always remembered that. And I find that, uh, that for people, non-Christians and Christians alike, sadly, Christians have just a hard time, too, admitting they're wrong. We'll make a hundred excuses for something, right, that's actually hurting us, an attitude or a mindset that's actually hurting us, and we'll just make a hundred excuses about it and fuss and fight before we change, before we admit, you know, just that we're wrong. Most of the time, we can't change ourselves. Is that true, too? Most of the time, stuff we struggle with, we can't, we can't just like flip a switch and change. What we can do is admit we're wrong. And that gets us broken loose. And then God can change it. Yeah, it's an amazing thing. It takes humility, though. Humility is one of those attitudes that um, if, if God is offering you the kingdom, humility is an attitude necessary to embrace and receive the kingdom. And if we don't... Um, Take, take on that attitude, we're going to be hindered. We're going to be stuck. Um, and the, the same guy also told me, I think his name was Les, uh, a long time ago. He said, be, be willing to admit you're wrong. And he said also, um, if you find that you are getting angry often uh, or too much, um, he said, you're, you're wrong. Just go ahead and assume you're wrong. <laughs> well, people are making me angry. No, it's you. You're wrong. You have a problem somewhere, somehow. If you're bitter, you're wrong. If you're frustrated, you're wrong. That was hard to take. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? I was 21, 22, you know, and, and he's telling me this stuff. I'm like, I'm just wrong? Yeah, you're just wrong. Just go ahead and admit it. You don't even have to know where you're wrong to start with. Just assume you're wrong. If you're, if you're angry and bitter and frustrated and, you know, negative and blah, blah, just assume you're wrong. Go ahead and admit it. And then ask God to help you figure out where. <laughs> it was great advice. It was so great. It was so great. It sounded so negative, but it was so great advice. <laughs> because I found out that I could get unstuck pretty quick. And if you ask God where you're wrong, you know what? He'll tell you. He's just pretty good about that. Why? Because he loves you. He wants you to get unstuck. Repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? You've got an attitude or a mindset or a belief or whatever it is that's keeping you from receiving the fullness of what God's offering you. I love you. Fix it. <laughs> Fix it. Oh, awesome stuff. How about uh, Matthew 18, 1 through 4? 
Uh, familiar story also. Let's see. Uh, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Right? We're looking for status and importance. Right? They're already jostling for position and recognition. And Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So, remember, Jesus is, uh, he's addressing different groups, right? Different situations. Uh, what was the first one? Just common people, the, the, the treasure in the field, just regular folks. If you, if you don't recognize the value of the kingdom that's being offered to you, right? There's, there's a place where you can get unstuck. And then he, then he addressed the Pharisees, the religious folks, right? Go and learn what it means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And... Uh, and now he's, he's addressing his own disciples, his own followers, who are dedicated to him and following him, but they've got ambition. <laughs> and they're after some status and some, you know, some, a little competition here and who's going to be you know, more important and whatever. And Jesus pulls out a little, little child, a little munchkin, sits him on his lap and says, this is how you got to be. And it just boom, pops their balloon, right? Because... <laughs> What's the child? The child's just like trusting and, you know, before they get all messed up, they're trusting and just pretty much happy to be in the moment and, you know, happy to have the love of people that care for them and, you know, want to have some fun. And he says, you've got to be like a child, just willing to trust and enjoy the moment and, and uh, enjoy the relationship and enjoy the adventure instead of being all fussing about what position and what status and, you know, pride and ego and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so again, he's just, he's addressing different people, but it's all the same thing. Repents so that attitudes don't keep you from receiving the fullness of the kingdom, entering into the kingdom and living victoriously in this kingdom that's available to you. Uh, we can see pretty easily based on that, the repentance is a, is a wonderful thing, isn't it? The crowd goes wild. It is. It's the way to get unstuck. God loves you. He wants you to have victory. <laughs> uh, let's see. Actually, look at one more. Revelation 3.19. This is, this is a, it's a verse that's actually kind of, it's kind of hard, actually. Jesus said this in the letters to the seven churches. Uh, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and, there it is again, Repent. What's this about? Um, <laughs> yeah, now this, this is, you know, kind of Bible language here. So it sounds a little bit more, you know. But uh, how does he start this thing again? Because if you read through the seven letters to, to the churches, right, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, uh, he's addressing these churches. And he'll usually tell them, this is what you're doing right. This is what's awesome. This is wonderful. Keep doing this. Hold on. Right? And then he'll address something that they're doing wrong that's out of agreement with his heart or whatever, uh, a wrong attitude, whatever, and, and he'll say, fix it, fix it, fix it. It's wrong, fix it. Um, and then he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. So what's his motive? Love. His motive is love. Uh, he wants us to have victory. He wants us to have breakthrough. He wants us to not get stuck. Right? Uh, don't get stuck. How many of you know people that are just stuck? Some wrong attitude and they're just stuck and you just want to slap them. Right? Just want to just slap them. <laughs> Get unstuck. Stop it. <laughs> and you know, you can see it, right? And it's called repentance. <laughs> Actually, yeah, people that will, that will listen to what Jesus said, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You're being offered something so amazing, a life so amazing, so powerful, so, so full, so rich, so joyful, so victorious, so supernatural. But don't let attitudes rob you, right? He says, I love you, and if I see you doing it with an attitude that's robbing you and limiting you and destroying you, ah, he says, I rebuke and I chasten. Like, stop it, fix it, right? <laughs> like, therefore, be zealous. That means, what does that just mean? That means get serious, right? Get, mm, and repent, Tra change your mind. Okay. So when you read through those letters, I mean, there's some hard stuff there. Here's, here's what's interesting. Um, the relationship that God has offered us because we know relationship is God's highest value. We know that very well. 
It's what he wants. And there's also, um, he he's also values freedom. We know that because he gave us free will, fully knowing that it would bring on the fall, right? And fully knowing that any relationship where there's genuine love, there has to be free will or it's meaningless, right? It's just completely artificial. Uh, so there has to be, he values freedom and choice, fully knowing that we'll make mistakes and mess things up, <laughs> right? And, and he invited us, even after the fall, you know, and the separation and the loss, the fall of man, what God, through, the, through Jesus, through the cross, the shed blood, the resurrection, right? Everything he did on our behalf, he restored the opportunity for relationship. Okay? He opened the door and he invited us and said, come on in, I want to have a relationship with you. Whoever believes, whoever calls on my name, come in, you're in. I will embrace you. And, and he cleared away any obstacles to the relationship. Really, he just, by the cross, isn't it true? We understand the finished work of Christ. He cleared away any obstacle to the relationship. No matter what kind of train wreck, train wreck we still are, God says, I'll have a relationship with you. Right? We'll work on you as we go. Right? But I, I want to have a relationship with you. I've, I've eliminated the obstacles. The door is open. Please come. Let's have a relationship. And it's not a master-servant relationship. Um, that was, again, kind of an Old Testament concept. But this is not a master-servant. This is a father-son. Right? This is love. This is genuine heart-to-heart -heart relationship that he wants. Um, when, we, uh, when we have a relationship with, and that's the kind of relationships we want to have with each other, right? We don't want to have relationships that are based on control and manipulation and right? all, that, all that kind of stuff where we're, influ where we're manipulating people's will and getting them to do stuff we want them to do even though they don't want to. We don't want, those are terrible relationships, right? They're not healthy. Real healthy relationship, there's freedom and in a healthy relationship, you get this from Danny Silk's books if you've been in the home groups. In a healthy relationship, you just tell somebody what your needs are. You don't try to manipulate them, control them, threaten them, shame them, you know, all the stuff that we do. You just tell them, here's what I want from you, here's what I need from you. And then you leave it with them to decide how to respond to what you've just told them. That's scary though because they might not respond correctly. So that's why we manipulate and control and threaten and <laughs> bribe and all kinds of stuff we do, right? But a healthy relationship, a powerful person will simply say to the other person they're in a relationship with, here's what I need from you, here's what I want from you. If you value me and if you value this relationship, here's what I need. What do you need? And then if we value the relationship, you say, I will provide for you what you need. And when you ask me, I will respond to you, right? And when I ask you, I'm, I, I need you to respond to me with no other kinds of control and weirdness and manipulation. I just, you decide how to respond. So if you value the person and value the relationship, you respond, right? You respond. That's what Jesus is doing here. He says, I've eliminated all the obstacles to our relationship. I've invited you into a full relationship. No, no probation, no, you know, no limitation. Full relationship. But when you're doing something that harms the relationship, and when you're doing something that is going to hurt you, I will tell you. <laughs> I will tell you. Because I love you. And I want you to change anything that's harming you, hindering you, destroying you. And I also want you to respond. This is Jesus talking. I want you to respond to me when I tell you, here's what I want in this relationship. I'm not going to force you, control you. You know, I'm going to tell you. And then we get to choose how we respond. And when the Lord speaks to us, we all know that sometimes, sometimes we respond and sometimes we go, la, 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 la. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, what he really wants us to do is just respond because there's freedom here. He's not, this is not master and slave and he's not saying you just have to, you just have to, because that whole master-slave thing is all about outward performance and conformity, right? It doesn't care about your heart and connection. And he says, no, this is freedom, this is connection, and I will tell you what I need from you and what I want from you and let you respond. Uh, and that's how we want to be with, with each other also. We want to be, first of all, be powerful enough people that when we have a need or a desire and with our spouse, family, friends, that we can just say so. Here's how I would like you to treat me or not treat me. Will you do that? 
I don't have to control you, manipulate you, threaten you, reward you. <laughs> you know, I just, here it is. And when somebody values you and values a relationship, they'll say, okay. And if somebody consistently doesn't respond to your needs and your wants, you know what they're saying? I don't really value you or a relationship with you. And then you have to decide whether to still pursue it or let it go. I don't, I'm not giving advice. I'm not saying where, what you should do. I'm just saying you have to look at reality there and say, hey, if somebody doesn't value a relationship with me, okay, I'm going to accept that. You know, <laughs> that's the reality of it. What you do, that's up to you. But Jesus does that too. If somebody consistently says, I want nothing to do with you. I'm not responding to you. No matter how many times you speak to me, I'm not responding to you. There's no relationship there, is there? There really isn't. So, um, so I guess, uh, there's a few minutes left. The, 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 the thing, uh, point I want to make, and I hope I'm making, is, again, that repentance, uh, it just sounds like, you know, a funky old Bible word, but especially in the original language, change of attitude, change of thinking, change of mind. It's so powerful. It's the way to get unstuck with God. Okay? Jesus absolutely declared, here's the kingdom. Repent, though, so that you can get it all, so that you can enter into it and enjoy it and walk in the fullness of it. Nothing hindering you, nothing destroying you, nothing robbing this. And, uh, and with people, too, in our relationships. When, how many of you have been stuck, had a wrong, wrong attitude towards people? You just, you just been stuck in a place and, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just assume you're wrong. <laughs> right? Just right off the bat, if you're, if you're bitter, angry, frustrated, or whatever. Now, it, it may not be all you. Probably isn't all you. <laughs> Probably isn't. But for starters, assume that you're wrong somewhere, somehow. Just do. Just do. And ask God to show you where. You'll get unstuck. You'll get unstuck. And, you know, in relationships, we have, a, I call it a rejection cycle. And it happens in marriage all the time. If people come to me for marriage help, almost, almost 100% of the time, this is what it is. I feel rejected by... Her, she feels rejected by me. When did it start? I don't know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, right? Or five days ago, whatever it is. I feel rejected by you, you feel rejected by me. Who started it? I don't know, don't even remember. All we know is we keep dishing it back to each other. We're, we're punishing each other and teaching each other a lesson. I'm gonna teach you a lesson. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna show you how it feels. And what does that do? The rejection cycle continues to spiral down, 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 down. It's stupid. It's really stupid. Can I say that? That bluntly, it's really stupid. Stop the cycle. Right? Stop the cycle. <laughs> and, and respond to each other's needs with love. Even if you have to go first. Even if you have to forgive all kinds of stuff you don't want to forgive. Just break the cycle. And, uh, and one of the things, uh, repentance just is a reset. It fixes... It breaks you, it gets you unstuck. And then um, the last thing I guess I want to, I want to share with you, uh, I don't have a scripture for it, but I mean the principles are biblical. How do you, how do you repair, try to repair a relationship that, that you've damaged? Okay. Have has anybody here damaged a relationship? You've, you, okay. Some of you have, yeah. Um, some of you are only the victim, but, but uh, <laughs> most of us have damaged relationships somehow, some way. And when we have done that, again, we, we assume we're wrong, right? And we can just, just start there. And then, not 100% wrong probably, but our side of the street. Let's look at our side of the street. And so, um, the, one of the first things to do when you know you've damaged a relationship and it's strained or it's broken or whatever it is, is go to the person and say, um, I was, what's the word we're looking at? Wrong, yeah, I was wrong. Wrong. Practice that word. Wrong. There we go. That's good. That's good. <laughs> oh, it always, it always pops back into my head when I when I say that. Remember, um, did anybody ever watch Happy Days? In an issue of Happy Days, when yeah. Fonzie was having trouble yeah. dating myself bad here, but you know, I guess most well, a lot of you are with me. Dating. Yeah, when when Fonzie had to say I was wrong, and it was so hard. He was like, I was. <laughs> Could, so hard to say. So and I and I totally relate to that. It's hard to say I was wrong, right? Eh? So, you don't say, I did that because. Don't even go there. Say, I was wrong. 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 Okay. And, because that's probably what the other person needs to hear from you. 
They might need to say it too, but we're only working on our side of the street right now, okay? So you say, I was wrong. And then you say, that I, I, I acknowledge that I made you feel whatever it was, rejected, hurt, unimportant, whatever it was, whatever it was. I acknowledge that I made you feel this way. I, I hurt you, I did damage somehow. Really important to say that. Because what we mostly want to do is say, uh, sorry, it, I did that because, and when you say, sorry, I did that because, you know what? Nobody cares. It doesn't heal anything. Amen. It doesn't heal anything. But I was wrong, and I hurt you, and I made you feel unimportant, or whatever it is. That begins to heal. That begins to get unstuck. Like, okay, you got my attention. And then uh, you uh, do what's called... Uh, well, then you, oh, number three, you ask for forgiveness. Sorry, I was going to skip a step. Ask for forgiveness. Again, sorry and please forgive me are two very, very different things. Right? They're very different things. I'm sorry, it doesn't do much. It's better than nothing, but it doesn't do much. Please forgive me. That does a whole lot. That's powerful stuff. Please forgive me. I hurt you, I was wrong. Please forgive me. Very hard to get out of your mouth, <laughs> but that's where, that's where you get, really get unstuck. And then, uh, if you've done that, then you say, how can I repair? How can I try to repair here and uh, make amends, try to rebuild, try to restore trust, or whatever it may be, whatever it may be. And then you genuinely try to do that, right? Um, but I uh, found that those little tools, most people just genuinely don't know how to do that. <laughs> and even the ones who know how don't usually do it. <laughs> it's like, no, it's just too hard. It's just too hard. I'll say sorry, I did that because I'm Italian. Whatever. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't work, does it? I'm not Italian, I just made that up. So. <laughs> uh, I got it. Let's pray. Let's pray. Can we stand together? Yeah. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, welcome, welcome, welcome. You've been here, moving in our hearts, speaking to our hearts, revealing your word, revealing your heart to us, revealing to us kingdom keys. And now, uh, in these next few moments or minutes, we ask that you would come in your manifested presence, moving in our hearts moving in this place Holy Spirit drawing us one more time into an encounter with Jesus right now one who loves us the one who loves us who wants to see us walking in freedom and victory in an intimate relationship with him in freedom in honor hallelujah Come Holy Spirit breathe on us just begin to rest upon each person here again. Your presence and power coming down upon them, bubbling up within them. Revelation and understanding, wisdom for relationships, and a revelation of most of all of your heart towards us, God, that we would never misunderstand what you're saying to us, but that we would know your heart and therefore correctly understand, correctly interpret everything you say and why you say it for our good for our victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And so I just want to pray also in these, in these moments, Holy Spirit, just begin to show us right now, each one of us personally, any area where we need to metanoia, have a change of attitude, of mindset. In our relationship with you. And coming into agreement with your heart as you show us that. Or some something that's destroying us, damaging us, limiting us. 
especially if it's something that we're defending and excusing. God, we don't want to do that. We want to get free and unstuck. Show us anything we need to metanoia, repent of. And to just admit that we're wrong and then go from there. Begin to get unstuck. And then embrace truth that sets us free, that empowers us, that brings us into victory. You speak to each heart, Lord. Any attitude that needs to be changed. You love your people. Who you love, you speak to. I also pray, God, that you show each one of us if there's any area of relationship, a person in our life that we need to value more, like the treasure in the field, a person in our life that we've had wrong attitude toward, a person in our life that we've not been responsive to their needs or desires, and we say that they're important to us, but we don't respond to them the way they ask. And I pray that you would make every person in this room also a powerful person that instead of resorting to manipulation or threats or punishment or rewards or bribes or manipulations, that each person in here would be a powerful person that in their relationships, relationships they would simply say, here's what I'm needing from you. Here's what I'm asking from you. Because you do that, Lord. You do that with us. As you speak to our hearts, God, we want to respond to you because we value our relationship with you. It's not about bad trying to be good. It's about God who has given us a complete invitation to a relationship. He has removed every obstacle, but who also says, here's what I want from you. Here's how I want you to walk with me and respond to my heart. Just another few moments. Holy Spirit, to speak to people's hearts. That they would have healthy, beautiful relationships and get unstuck. That every person would have the grace and humility from God to quickly be able to say, I might be wrong. feel the presence of God is really, really strong. Yeah.